everybody doing? Everybody doing okay? Amen. See some heads shaking, yes? The rest of you shaking, no? I no. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, today I uh, would like to continue in the, uh, the study that we started last week in Psalms 23. Uh, last week we hit the very first part of Psalm 23. I'll read the whole psalm to you, but uh, we're going to be going through the 23rd psalm very slowly, I guess you might say. But And I've never really uh, preached this way, but we're going to do kind of what I might say a, a book review. Uh, we started into uh, the 23rd psalm last week following along this little book that I picked up years ago uh, by W. Philip Keller, A Shepherd Looks at Psalms 23. Uh, some of you that weren't here last week, uh, we got through half of the first verse, The Lord is My Shepherd. And we spoke on that, or I spoke on that, uh, explaining what those words truly truly mean. So today we're going to be looking at the second part of verse 1. <laughs> I shall not be in want, but let's read the whole 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this psalm, this psalm of David, Father God. And as we continue this study in the, in the words of this psalm, may we take it to heart. May we take it to understanding the meaning behind what David's was meaning by this psalm. May we not just read through it as we would read a book or, or just pass through it without trying to understand. So, Father God, give me wisdom and give, the, give us all ears to hear the truth that you want us to take from these words, from this psalm that David has given us all those years ago. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The 23rd Psalm is probably the, the best known psalm. That's probably one of the best known psalms that there is. Most people uh, know it by heart. A lot of people know it by heart, have learned the scripture, and have, uh, it has been spoken in many places. As I researched this, I found out... Oh, there's my pen. I found out <clears throat> some different things about it where it has, it has been spoken. Augustine called it the martyr's psalm because so many people recited it as they died for their faith. Abraham Lincoln was said to recite Psalm 23 during the darkest days of the Civil War. George W. Bush reminded the nation that the Lord is our shepherd after 9-11. Charles Spurgeon called this psalm one of the seven wonders of the world. Wow, one of the seven wonders of the world. James Montgomery Boyce wrote, Millions of people have memorized this psalm. Ministers have used it to comfort people who are going through severe personal trials, suffering illnesses, or dying. For some, the words of this psalm have been the last words they have spoken in this life. And I will add to that, it is the last words that many have heard while in this life as well. This 3,000 year old psalm 
has brought comfort and hope to countless believers throughout the years. <clears throat> now last week we looked at the very first words of verse 1 of this, the Lord is my shepherd. And David, when he spoke this, as we studied and we looked at this, David was proud to say, the Lord, he is my shepherd. The Lord is the one that watches over me. The Lord is the one that cares for me. The Lord is the one that owns me. As we looked at that and went through the concept of knowing that the earth proclaiming that the Lord is your shepherd. David was very boisterous, or he started off the psalm in that way, that the Lord is the one that takes care of me. Continuing on in that, we will go into what the second part of verse 1 is. I shall not be in want. So as far as what David is telling us here is the Lord is my shepherd so therefore I shall not be in want but you know if you were to tell that to many people and they would read this psalm and say the Lord's my shepherd I shall not be in want they would say what a lie the scripture is they would say that's not true by no means because I'm a Christian and I go to church and I believe in the Lord and, and I follow after him and I read my Bible. But, you know, I still, I still want. I still have wants. I still have things that I need. Well, the thing that I want to look at here, or want to, I want to stop right here and, and tell you is that, uh, that we all have needs that need to be met. But there's a difference between needs and wants. I need a house or uh, I need a place to live. I need a place to stay and to, to live in that. I need a car and where I'm at, I need a car to get around and travel uh, to get groceries or to do the things that I need to do. Now, you know, I would want, I want, would like to have a new car. You know, I'd like to have a brand new car, but do I need a new car? No, because my old car gets me where I need to go. There's nothing wrong with it. It gets me back and forth. The heater works sometimes in the winter time. And you know, and the air conditioning's broke, but I just wind the window down in the truck, you know, so it's like, it gets me where I need to go. I want a new one, but hey, I can get along with that old one. And also it'd be nice if I, if I, I, I want, or it'd be nice if I had a mansion Overlooking the ocean with an ocean view, you know, and the beach is all laying before me and all. Boy, it'd be nice to live in something like that. I want a place like that. But you know, my home, the house that I live in, it's comfortable. It's not got much of a view. There's a hillside behind me and, and trees and houses around me. But, but it's, it, it does its job. It's comfortable. I'm able to live there. So do I want a new house? Yeah, it'd be nice to have that ocean view. But do I need a new house? No. The one I have is fine. So as Christians, we need to understand that life isn't about our material needs or our material wants. Our life isn't about those things. If we look at John the Baptist, we could say, John, brother, that camel hair suit that you're wearing and that camel hair jacket that you're wearing just isn't cutting it. These people are coming from all over the area. They're coming from everywhere to be baptized you, by you, be baptized by you, and there you are wearing that camel hair suit. It really isn't fitting of a preacher, you know, as, as many preachers. Well, nowadays, wearing a tie and a suit isn't the thing. But, jo but John the Baptist, he ate what? Locust and wild honey. So there's an example. His material needs were met by what was provided to him. And if we even look at Elijah, when Elijah was fleeing uh, to being, being persecuted by Jezebel and Ahab, what, he, he fled. God said, go, go to this ravine. So he went to this ravine out in the middle of nowhere and he said, 
Don't worry, Elijah, I'll have the birds feed you. The ravens will feed you. So the ravens, they would bring bread and they would bring meat for Elijah to live on as he slept in a cave or slept wherever. So he didn't live in the lap of luxury. He didn't have what we would call material items or material things. God provided what he needed. And even Jesus said, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. So what David is telling us here is to be content. I shall not want. Be content in what we have. To be content in what God has given us. And with that, I'd like to read from the uh, from this book that uh, we're following along in. And as this uh, man looks at what it's like to be the shepherd of the sheep. And that's what David is bringing out. What it is to be. David is proclaiming, I'm one of the sheep. Because the Lord is my shepherd. So he's proclaiming to be one of the sheep. When all is said and done, the welfare of any flock is entirely dependent upon the management afforded them by their owner. The tenant sheepman on the farm next to my first ranch was the most indifferent manager I had ever met. He was not concerned about the condition of his sheep. His land was neglected. He gave little or no time to his flock, letting them pretty well forage for themselves as best they could both, they could, both summer and winter. They fell prey to dogs, cougars, and rustlers. Every year these poor creatures were forced to gnaw away at bare brown fields and impoverished pastures. Every winter there was a shortage of nourishing hay and wholesome grain to feed the hungry ewes. Shelter to safeguard and protect the suffering sheep from storm and blizzards was scanty and inadequate. They had only polluted muddy water to drink there, there had been a lack of salt and other trace minerals needed to offset their sickly pastures. In their thin, weak, and diseased condition, these poor sheep were a pathetic sight. In my mind's eye, I can still see them standing at the fence, huddled sadly in little knots, staring wishfully through the wires at the rich pastures on the other side. To all their distress, the heartless, selfish owner seemed utterly callous and indifferent. He simply did not care. What if his sheep did want green grass, fresh water, shade, safety, or shelter from the storms? What if they did want relief from wounds, bruises, disease, and parasites? He ignored their needs. He couldn't care less. Why should he? They were just sheep, fit only for the slaughterhouse. I never looked at those poor sheep without an acute awareness that this was a precise picture of those wretched old taskmasters, sin and Satan, on their derelict ranch, scoffing at the plight of those within their power. As I have moved among men and women from all strata of society, as both a lay pastor and as a scientist, I have become increasingly aware of one thing. It is the boss, the manager, the master in people's lives who makes a difference in their destiny. I have known some of the wealthiest men on this continent intimately, also some of the leading scientists and professional people. Despite their dazzling outward show of success, despite their affluence and their prestige, they remained poor in spirit, shriveled in soul, and unhappy in life. They were joyless people held in the iron grip and heartless ownership of the wrong master. By way of contrast, I have numerous friends among relatively poor people, people who have known hardship, disaster, and the struggle to stay afloat financially. But because they belong to Christ 
and have recognized him as Lord and master of their lives, their owner and manager, they are permeated by a deep, quiet, settled peace that is beautiful to behold. It is indeed a delight to visit some of these humble homes where men and women are rich in spirit, generous in heart, and large of soul. They radiate a sincere confidence and quiet joy that surmounts all the tragedies of their, their time. They are under God's care, and they know it. They have entrusted themselves to Christ's control and found contentment. So what David is saying here through through what what we're experiencing as a shepherd shepherd the the people that are under the care of the good shepherd live in peace no matter what's been dealt to them. Financial things doesn't matter does it? Some of the richest people in the world are probably the most uh, saddest I would think. They are Truly, we hear that all the time about people that are looking for something to fulfill their lives. They have money. They have the wealth. They have the prestige. They can get anything they want. But all they can do is bring things in or buy things, but it doesn't make them happy. It doesn't bring joy to their lives. It, it, like, it doesn't settle them in spirit. It doesn't settle them in their heart. They're not content. In what they have. They're not content in the things that are around them. They're always looking for something more. So what David is telling us here is to be content under the Good Shepherd. To be content in what he has given us or what the Good Shepherd is providing for us. Not craving after something else or not desiring something else but to be happier, to be, to be satisfied in what God has given us or what the Good Shepherd has given us. And with that, I want to look at Luke uh, chapter 12, 16 through 20. This kind of sums it up. This little bit of scripture sums that up to be content with what we had, have, not to be looking for something more. This is Jesus, and he tells this to the disciples. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for the many years. Take life easy. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Because you've been blessed. You've got nothing to worry about. Tear down your old barns and build new ones so you can store it all up and have it for yourself. Basically is what this guy is saying. I'm going to have it for myself. I'm set. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. So in this scripture, and what we're hearing from Jesus is the same thing that is David is saying. Be content with what you have. Be content under the care of the good shepherd. Don't worry about all the things that, that uh, you may have or you want to store up or you want to keep for yourself. Scripture tells us where to store up our treasures. Where should we store up our treasures? It says if you put it in barns, you'll lose your life because you think you have it all. And he says if you put it in gold and silver, things will rust and fires will destroy. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where nothing can destroy it. No moth can get into heaven and destroy the treasures you have stored up there. And those aren't financial treasures, but it's the treasures that God has given that we have blessed God through. By speaking his word, speaking his truth to our family, to our friends, being out there and proclaiming that God is our Savior, that, that Jesus is our Savior, and that we follow the Lord himself. 
So the thing is, we need to be content in what we have and not out searching and looking for things that we have no control over. We have no control over. With that, I'd like to read too and, uh, some more from this book. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I am completely satisfied, this is what it should be, I am completely satisfied with his management of my life. Why? Because he is a sheepman to whom no trouble is too great, as he cares for his flock. He is the rancher who is outstanding beside, <laughs> outstanding because of his fondness for sheep who loves them for their own sake as well as his personal, personal pleasure in them. He will, if necessary, be on the job 24 hours a day to see that they are properly provided for in every detail. Above all, he is very jealous of his name and high reputation as the Good Shepherd. He is the owner who delights in his flock, for him there is no greater reward, no deeper satisfaction than that of seeing his sheep contented, well fed, safe, and flourishing under his care. This is indeed his very life. He gives all he has to it. He literally lays himself out for those who are his. What he's saying here is that the, the, the shepherd, the good shepherd, a good shepherd, his whole life revolves around his sheep. Every day when he gets up, he checks out on the sheep. He checks them and makes sure they're doing good. He watches out for them. So his whole life revolves around his flock. And that's what Jesus is all about. His whole life was given for the sheep. For you and I, we are the sheep of his pasture. He is the owner who delights in his flock. For him there is no great... I already read that, didn't I? There is no deeper satisfaction than that of seeing his sheep contented, well fed, safe and flourishing under his care. That's what Jesus wants to see us. As the great shepherd, he wants to see us content in his care. From early dawn until late at night, this utterly selfless shepherd is alert to the welfare of his flock. For the diligent sheepman rises early and goes out first thing every morning without fail to look over his flock. It is the initial intimate contact of that day. With a, <clears throat> with a practice searching sympathetic eye, he examines the sheep to see that they are fit and content and able to be on their feet. In an instant, he can tell if they have been molested during the night, whether any are ill or if there are some which require special attention. Isn't that something? With a trained eye, the sheepman can check out on the sheep. Just by looking out, he knows which ones need his attention. He's referring that to the good shepherd. And we're the sheep. Isn't that, that's just, that just blows my mind. That God watches over us. He sees that. He knows who needs the attention for that day. Repeatedly throughout the day, he casts his eye over the flock to make sure that all is well. He sleeps, as it were, with one eye and both ears open, ready at the least sign of trouble to leap up and protect his own. This is a sublime picture of the care given to those whose lives are under Christ's control. He knows all about our lives from morning to night. We are, on, are under the watchful care of the Good Shepherd, the one that lays down, laid down his life for the sheep. We are the ones that God watches over. He rises up, and, or he doesn't rise up, he stays up. He's always watchful, always watching over us. As this shepherd rises up the first thing in the morning, he watches over the sheep and checks them out throughout the day. I'd like to read to you from John 10, starting at chapter 10, starting at verse 10. <clears throat> the 
The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I have come, the good shepherd has come to watch over us and to see that our lives are fulfilled. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is the hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. <clears throat> as we follow along in this book we get further and further into this psalm but as we look at this first verse the very first verse in this psalm the Lord is my shepherd I shall not be in want. The thing that David, or what David is telling us in this psalm is that I am proud that the Lord is my shepherd because he is the one that will watch over me. He's the one that cares for me. And because he cares so greatly for me, he has given everything for me. He lays down his life for me, for my protection to watch over me. I don't need to want anything else because in the Lord Jesus Christ, I have it all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day, for this word. Father God, as we follow along in this psalm, may we just, may we just drink it in. May we just soak it all up, Father God, the truth that we have heard from David and following along with this, with this shepherd's view of what it is to be the shepherd and the sheep. Father God, may you instill in us, may you help us, may you continue to be with us that we can under your, understand your word deeper and deeper and drink it into our souls and into our lives and to who we are, Father God. There is so much richness and, richness and so much nourishment from your word, Father God. May we continue to study. May we continue to read. May we continue to be blessed by you, opening our eyes to the truth of this word, word Father God. And may we understand the blessings that it is when we say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Thank you, Lord, for this word and the truth of us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thomas, do we have a, <clears throat> a final hymn?